Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Hancock. I am one of the board members of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And today is our Lunch and Learn for Humanistic Management Professionals. We do have with us Lene Rachel Anderson. Say hi, Rachel. Lene. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my co-host today is Elizabeth Castillo. She's one of my colleagues on the board. Elizabeth, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great. So, Lene is going to be talking to us about the Build on Rose and how it can be used as a strategic tool, but also just in general as a way to think about integrating values and acting on them. Uh, she is uh, from, uh, she's got her own company, the Build on Rose and she does consulting and she's an educator and she's super cool. So Lene, come on and introduce yourself and let's get started. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank you to everybody who, who joins us this, uh, I would say noon and evening. I'm in Copenhagen, so it's, it's six o'clock here and uh, almost a Friday evening. So, um, but I've been looking very much forward to this and I'm looking really, I, I love talking about these matters. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to, to get a chance to meet you. So what I promised to do here um, is to uh, talk about what is Bildung because it's a German concept that is not familiar. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an imported concept in the, uh, in the English language. And I know that a lot of people are not familiar with it. And then I'm gonna talk about the model, the building rows. And my background for talking about this is that I am originally uh, a business economist. I studied theology for a number of years and then I wrote comedy for Danish television uh, before I started writing books about the future and big history. And uh, my latest book is called Bildung, Keep Growing, and, and you can see it here, um, which is, uh, of course, uh, about Bildung, as the title suggests. So what is Bildung? Originally, uh, this concept uh, referred to build, uh, which in German means um, an image. So it's the human personality developing in the image of something. And originally it was a Christian concept and it was the image of God or Christ. So Bildung was a spiritual inner Christian moral development. Around the 1750s, it gets a secular meaning among German philosophers and it becomes a question of developing your personal character. And among the Bildung philosophers were people like Goethe and Herder and Schiller and Fichte and Hegel and von Humboldt. And I'm not gonna go into details with all of them, but I am gonna mention one of them and that is Friedrich Schiller. Um, and the reason why I'm gonna bring up Friedrich Schiller is because he wrote a very simple, or simple, but he wrote a, yeah, a simple definition of what is Bildung, this very, a uh, complex thing because it entails both moral and emotional development and education. So both the uh, education and knowledge that you can share with other people, that things you can learn from one, from another person, things that you can teach others, and then the knowledge or emotional and moral development that you cannot share with others. I mean, if, if I make a mistake and learn from it, I can tell other people about my mistake, but other people will not have made that mistake and understood emotionally what it meant to make that mistake. So it's a different kind of learning, it's a different kind of knowledge, but Bildung uh, means both of them. And so the emotional development is what Schiller was focusing on and he wrote about it in a book that you can find out there uh, in an English translation and it's called uh, on the aesthetic education of man. And why did he combine building and education and aesthetics, beauty? Well, here's why. Um, because Schiller said that there are three kinds of people. In order to illustrate that, I, I brought uh, a little friend of mine uh, because he said the first kind of person or the first kind of people uh, are the emotional people. They are in the throes of their emotions and therefore they are not free because their emotions are controlling them. But you can transcend these emotions and become a team player on behalf of society or among your peers, Schiller of course did not use the word team player because he was German and the word team player had not been invented yet, but you can become um, a 
a good citizen, you can follow the rationale of society and make it your own. You can become what modern developmental psychology would call to be self-governing. And I, I brought another little friend to, um, to illustrate that. And so if you're one of the uh, rational people in society, you follow the rationale of society and you're a good team player. And it's really important that we go through this kind of development. Um, but if you're following the norms and expectations of others, you're not free either. So you have to transcend this phase in your life as well and become what Sheila called the moral person. And, uh, and the moral person is, uh, I mean, this is who I brought to illustrate that. So the moral person is the person who has reconnected with his or her own emotions, but who is still a loyal team player among others and who has integrated these two things into his character and is now uh, morally independent, but still part of the, of the polite company. Um, and the moral person, Schiller says, and this is the interesting part, um, is really the only person who's free because he or she has the freedom to overrule his emotions and to overrule the expectations of others, which is what we kind of expect from one another when we are adults. Um, and the context for Schiller talking about this is also really interesting because he talked about it in the context of, or the aftermath of the French Revolution. And what he was talking about was um, the emotional persons are not free to enjoy political freedom because they're in the throes of their emotions and therefore are not free to make political decisions. Um, and in the bloodbath of the French Revolution, he said, these are the people that once you have decapitated the, uh, the tyrant, they just want to see more blood because they're, now they're all fired up and angry. The rational people who are taking their directions from others are just following these people. So they're not free to, uh, to, to handle political freedom either. And the only people who can handle political freedom are the moral persons. So this emotional development um, is Bildung, the result is Bildung, and the process is Bildung. And if you look at this from the perspective of modern developmental psychology, um, this can be called the self the self-consolidating person, the self-governing person, and the self-authoring person. And, um, and we are not right now uh, connecting developmental psychology to, uh, to political freedom, but it's absolutely a, uh, a discussion that is, that is worth having. So um, I'm not going to say goodbye to my little friends here. I'm going to put them uh, to the side, and then I'm going to talk about the building rose, because this inner development, the building part that I just described, is the, the development that you cannot share with other people. Um, and I'm going to uh, share my screen and, uh, and show the building rows. So I hope that uh, that, that works. And um, let's see if this works. And, um, let's see. Yeah, we can see it. Good, yeah, but I can I can get a full screen. This is better, right? Can you see the full screen here? Yes, that's good. Good, excellent. So this is the uh, the building rows, and the idea behind this model is that this is a picture or a simplification of society, any society really. All societies have production; otherwise, there would be no food and shelter. All societies have technology. Uh, we have tools of all kinds. All kinds of societies may not have science, but they have knowledge of a scientific quality. I mean, facts about their surroundings and the real world in which they live. Uh, all societies have power structure uh, of some sort in our modern day and age. It is a, a political system, a democratic system, but it could be a religious system. Any society has a power structure of some sort. And all uh, societies also have aesthetics. It's a basic human trait that we care about beauty and we spend a lot of time on beauty, either our own or on art of different kinds, music, paintings, whatever. And then all societies also have narrative. This can be 
religious narrative, it can be ideology, or it can be the history that brought us to where we are today. But we need to know where we're coming from. Otherwise, we cannot figure out where we want to go. And then ethics. And uh, the way that I distinguish between ethics and morals in this, in this model is that the moral values is what are represented in the narrative, in the uh, religions or in the uh, ideologies or in the rituals and stories that we tell about ourselves and our societies, that is, I mean, that has a moral value. It, it represents moral value and moral values are what we use in order to know how to act in familiar situations. Whereas ethics are the, uh, the principles that we're using in order to figure out how to act and behave in unfamiliar situations. And so we need both morals and ethics in our societies. We need narrative, we need aesthetics, we need to have a power structure, we need scientific knowledge, and of course we need production and technology. So all societies have this. And the point here is that in order to thrive in any society, in our own society, um, we need to understand these seven domains to some extent uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to provide to provide for ourselves. We're going to harm ourselves with technologies, or we're going to harm other people. Uh, or uh, if we don't get the aesthetics and don't understand the knowledge that is around, we cannot navigate society. Uh, if we don't understand the power structure, we're going to get in trouble all the time. And if we don't share the narrative and understand the ethics, we're going to be behaving in in morally. Uh, wrong ways according to the norms and expectations of others and the rest of society. So in order to thrive in our society, our inner world needs to, to some extent, match the outer world, or at least we need to understand the outer world. And by setting it up in these seven domains, this becomes a tool for, for analyzing our surroundings and also our own understanding uh, of this. There, a number of ways of using this model, but one of them is to talk about the top and the bottom of the model, because the two domains towards the top represent what is physically possible here and now. And in our market-driven uh, societies, this is where the money is generated. Then the middle layer is what might be possible. And the bottom layer, or the foundation you could call it, is what ought to be. And what we're doing right now in Western civilization is that we're spending all our time and energy, at least most of it, uh, particularly in the public debate in the around uh, production and how can we generate more money in the system. Whereas the conversation about what might be possible is extremely weak and the conversation about what ought to be is more or less absent from, uh, from the bigger society. And this means that there are conversations in our society and among ourselves as citizens that we simply do not have and we, and we ought to have those conversations. Um, if these domains collaborate, I mean, they can fight each other. Um, you can just run for profit and then forget about the rest of society. But these domains can also collaborate. And if we, uh, the green arrow, which represents production, if that has ethics, which is represented by the red arrow, we can have sustainable prosperity in society. And who wouldn't want that? If uh, the aesthetics and the science collaborate, the blue and, and the orange here, we can have deep education or building and deep understanding, which allows us to talk about what could, what could be and, and what are the solutions that we can come up with together. And then of course, if technology just, you know, keeps evolving and forgets about the narratives in society and the moral values that allow us to have stable societies, um, it can disrupt society. But if they collaborate, if there's a mutual respect, and also if, for instance, um, religious leaders and uh, religious people accept that with technological development, society and culture are changing, uh, so we need to reevaluate how how can these narratives become continue to be meaningful, um, and so this this model this building rose shows the domains in which we need to educate ourselves and each other and 
children and young people in order to understand society. And um, if I just go back to, uh, to the beginning here, uh, we're just starting to work with this model in, uh, in Nordic Bildung, the think tank where we uh, have published a paper about it and it's also in, in, the, uh, in the Bildung book. Um, but one of, the, one of the ways that we want people to start or hope that people will use this model is as a way of structuring their thinking about their organizations, about their personal life, about their education, um, about how to be a good citizen, and to have conversations about um, where, where do I feel comfortable or capable or empowered in my own society, and where am I lacking knowledge? Where do I get confused? Where, where do I feel anxiety? Where is my knowledge to limit it in order to engage in meaningful and productive ways? And we are in a, in a time of great transition and changes and disruption right now, not least due to technological development. And the majority, not just of citizens, but also of politicians and other decision makers simply do not understand the technologies that are fundamentally changing our civilization right now. So um, in order to have meaningful conversations about this, we need a, a conversation about what kind of knowledge we need, but we also have to have that conversation about the inner moral and emotional development uh, that, that Schiller was talking about or that modern developmental psychology is talking about, which is how free are we to choose our own paths in this and make moral and ethical uh, decisions when we are facing challenges from these seven domains or just one of them and where can we find each other and have these conversations so uh, so that is that is the thinking about this uh, this building rose and uh, and you can also say that the what the building rose represents is sort of the horizontal knowledge about the world so you can say that the more complex the world becomes and the more each of these domains evolves and grows and becomes more complex in itself uh, the more knowledge we as individuals need to have about the world. And this is the kind of knowledge that we can actually teach each other. Uh, I can learn from other people about science and technology that I don't understand. And I can teach the things that I know to other people. But the vertical development, the moral and emotional development, the Schiller, what that Schiller was talking about, I cannot share that with other people. I have to make my own mistakes. I have to go through my own life crises. I have to uh, grow with the challenges that, that I meet. And, uh, and just to conclude on, on the aesthetics, because Schiller was talking about this as the uh, aesthetic, aesthetic education of man or of people. And, um, and what he said was that in this transition from the uh, emotional person to the uh, rational person to the uh, moral person it is aesthetics that can that can challenge us and move us and in the first transition in our personality it is calming aesthetics and it's beauty and it can align our emotions with the values and emotions of others and once you have the uh, acquired the sort of being attuned to other people through aesthetics and through your life experiences that is when we need aesthetics that can sort of wake us up and shake us up and we can become the moral person who can feel our own emotions again. So aesthetics um, is not just a sort of a luxury that, that we can sprinkle on the rest of society when we have enough money. It's really essential to, uh, to all of us that, that we enjoy uh, pop music, highbrow art, uh, paintings, uh, good storytelling and, uh, and beauty in order for us to uh, develop evolve as, uh, as individuals. So those were my, I hope, 15 minutes of, uh, of opening presentation. Ah, 20 minutes maybe, but okay. No, it, was, it was excellent. And I have to say, um, like presentations like this are the reason I love co-hosting this program. <laughs> I, I just feel very privileged that I get to talk to such really interesting people who's, you know, are able to blow my mind in some way. And, and this 
I, this resonates with me in like, I just look at that rose and I'm like, especially the one that kind of looks, breaks it out. That just, there's so much use in that. Like I can think of five different ways I could use that in my personal life and my professional life. So thank you so much for sharing with that. Um, Elizabeth, I know we have a couple of questions. If you had any questions that come up or as we're discussing them, please put them in the chat box. This program has been approved by HRCI and SHRM for continuing education credit. So later on, we'll tell you how to apply to get those certificates. Elizabeth? Um, hi, everyone. So I am actually going to start with Andrew Miller. Um, Andrew, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask it yourself um, because it's the same question that popped into my mind. Yeah. So what I was when seeing the the rows, seeing the power sitting in the middle, and sort of knowing, sort of to understand more about that and what assumptions you make about power, or how that fits in your model, um, just to sort of, yeah, it just seems pretty important since it's in the middle. Right. So uh, I mean, this is a model that I have spent fifteen years now working on it, and um, the, the aesthetics domain. I think was called entertainment to begin with, but then I realized that there was more to it than that. Um, but the reason why power is, is in the middle, I mean, there, there's a connection between, the, between each two of these domains all the way around. So production, from your point of view, I guess, production and technology are neighbors and collaborate. Uh, and technology gets its basic knowledge from science. And so uh, they, they're neighbors. Uh, and science works from ethics. Uh, it, there's, a, there's a method to the way that science works, otherwise it wouldn't be science. It would just be happenstance knowledge that either was right or wrong, and hopefully right. Um, the narrative is, and the moral values is the, uh, symbolic representation of the principles that that guide our society but because it represents the um, behaviors that are related to uh, familiar situations um, it is uh, it is a symbolic representation of the values that we have and that already told us how to behave in what used to be new situations so so ethics is both related to the narrative, religion, ideology, and to science, but it's, it's two different kinds of ethics in, in narrative and science. And then you have the, uh, the aesthetics, which is, of course, uh, particularly developed in religion, but is also assisting production in marketing and design of, of good products. So, so they are kind of, you know, reaching out to their neighbors. But they're also in a in a conflict, and they're typically in a conflict with uh, with that is, which is the furthest away from them, in the rows, and in the middle, um, power. I mean, power looks very different depending on which kind of society we're looking at. Uh, if we're looking at a hunter gatherer society, it would be the shaman or some wise old person that everybody you know asks for advice in a, th a theocracy or a tyranny or any kind of pre-modern societal uh, power structure. It would be a, a, a god king or um, a, a prophet or somebody like that who was, who was uh, in, in power usually or, or king of sort. And then uh, in, in democracy, we have, I mean, in power are institutions. So the power in that center looks very different depending on what kind of society we're looking at. And if you look at the building rows as an image of my inner world and who I am as a person and the knowledge that I have and how I relate to these uh, six outer domains, my power, my personal power is really the, uh, the building process that Schiller was talking about where I get more and more freedom and more and more power over myself and my life. Um, because I've, I've been going through this, this uh, emotional and moral development. And if I, um, if I do not know anything about any of these other six domains, I do not have a lot of personal power, neither as a citizen nor as, as a, 
I mean, the, the main power in my own life, because then I don't know enough to thrive or have influence or uh, connect with other people in meaningful ways in my own society. So the, the power in the middle, uh, if we talk about our individual empowerment in our own life, uh, is also depending on what goes on in these other domains. And as I indicated with uh, Rose, with the arrows that, that go across, if, if any one of these domains is not interested in being a good team player in society, uh, I mean, it, it could be, uh, for instance, production and the banks and uh, speculation uh, capitalism that is just generating so much money and moving money around the globe in order to avoid taxes that we have an entire sector uh, that also becomes typically becomes abusive uh, in, in other ways if profit is the only thing that people are interested in that it can tear the rest of society apart and it can it can corrupt the power in the middle but it can also just make the democratic uh, power system uh, impotent and useless and just uh, take over uh, society. So, um, so power in the middle can be understood in, in many ways, depending on how we look at, at the, or, or what we're using the, the model to describe. And as with any model, I mean, this is a, an oversimplification, but it's a way of, of uh, structuring our thinking about what kind of environment, cultural, um, environment are we uh, are we living in and what is it that we, we need to understand in order to to uh, create a meaningful life for ourselves can, can i follow up with that uh so i'm just going to reflect what i heard you say and then and ask you to uh feedback on that um you know as an individual if i was using this rose to think through things the power in the middle is my ability to judge yep. uh out of to balance these things what am i going to dominate which you know how do i when they're in conflict how do i adjudicate that conflict right and that's right. me as an individual and so then when we start moving out into organizations or into um society you know what is the power that we use to adjudicate these conflicts between that that naturally will arise between the different elements of the rose right and I, of course i mean if if we're talking about a, a company or uh, a, a local community or like a, uh, I don't know, church, a community center, whatever. I mean, wherever people are, are working together, they're also uh, power structures. And, and there are some people who have more, more power than others. And, and then, of course, the question is, is there one of these domains that is dominating the organization in, in an unhealthy way? And, uh, it, but that can also be the case in our individual life. I mean, you can be so, I mean, typically, I guess you would be so obsessed with, with making more money that you forget everything else, but you can also be so religious that you forget everything else. Or you can be so occupied with, uh, you know, technology and the latest gadgets that you forget everything else. And if we do that, I mean, that, that may be fascinating during the weekend or it, it'll be great as a, you know, uh, thing to do during the summer and, you know, really immerse yourself in a, in a topic. That's great. But if one of these domains is taking over your life, uh, you're going to, you're going to be missing something and, and you're also going to be hard to, uh, to relate to for other people. And then you may be on a path towards a lot of, uh, um, uh, uh, loneliness and and other kinds of problems. So, uh, and you could also look at your own life and say, so where where are my where are my main interests? What makes me happy? I mean, if if I were to live a really balanced and happy life, what is it in my life that is missing? What is it in my life that I really would would love to have more of? And uh, and I guess to uh, I mean a lot of people uh, we we spend our our youth and most productive years pursuing, uh, you know, establishing our, our family and a solid uh, economy, uh, buying a house and uh, getting into debt and, uh, you know, getting an, an education in order to get a job and all that stuff. And of course we do that, but, but it can also become an obsession where you forget that you also need to live. You know, also need to fill in all the other uh, parts of your life, otherwise you're gonna you're gonna suffer emotionally. 
um, either because there's something missing and you can't tell what it is, or because you um, you simply miss the uh, the language and the connecting points with other people where you can have meaningful conversations and inspiring you know dinner conversations and hang out with people and and have uh, meaningful encounters. Um, Andrew, did that get to the questions that you there? Did you have any comments on that, Andrew? No, that was that was really helpful because I think that a lot of I'm in a lot of dealing with models of how to work with this. So this is coming a lot into the idea of power and power imbalances and the lack of my students feeling that they have the ability to actually engage with um, with working towards like more social social um, social causes in, in from a business setting and stuff like that and so the the, the economic side once you once you remove the, the power balances or the ability to act on your own really the models start to fall apart exactly and that that happens at the individual level but it also happens at societal level and it would happen in in any organization that that isn't careful and to remember all all seven domains um so yeah um, great. Well, thank you so much, Lene. Um, I'm going to get to Ron Nazar. He had raised his hand. So, Ron, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hello. Uh, that was a, can you hear me all right? Yes. Good. All right. You have an incredible background. I'm so envious, and I'm sure you read Schiller in the original, which I'll never do. And Hegel too. I cheated and, and wrote in, in two English translations, and then I, oh. I I did I did read some of the original Schiller in in German, um, but uh, not the entire book. Well, the, the the question is, do we need to go back to the to the God building? Have we? Do we need to retrieve that? Because uh, what I my field of study has been at, at a different time, but in the early 18th century, the the redo of the curriculum in Scotland which had a big impact in our country uh, on Princeton and William and Mary and Thomas Jefferson and all the rest. But what they did is that they watered down pneumatology and natural theology, they called it, and made it all uh, pneumatics. And they, so the thing I've been interested in is going from pneumatology to pneumatics. And, and you, what does I that think, mean? I, I would love if you could uh, explain that word pneumatics because it's it's new to me and there may other also be others. Who well, pneuma, pneumatology, well, it, it was a field of study and essentially it was the movement of the spirit. They were trying to figure out natural law and uh, nat natural law was a big idea. They called it natural theology. Then they okay. called it, um, uh, 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 what was it, e experimental philosophy. And then they discovered, then they got into the sciences and they found out, well, okay, well, we know well, now we know about electricity and gravity and Newton and all the rest. And so they lost this idea of the movement of the spirit, the Thomistic ideas of education. And so we keep thinking, you know, with, you know, Chardin, which is the name we'll be familiar with some of you, certainly we Jesuit educated people know him. But this whole idea of, is there a movement? Do we need a bigger image of, of, uh, of society now and of the world? And are we part of a larger story? And so I've just been intrigued by this idea that we have dismissed because pneumatology, essentially it is discernment of the spirit in our lives and Jesuit education. That's what it's based on is discernment. And so we keep thinking, do we need to go back? And that's why your idea of building though, and the fact that you've looked at it from both perspectives, there is an aesthetic to it that then moves us to energy. And so we, do, we keep telling our students, where do you wish to invest your energy and what moves you? And so I, I just would, you have such a unique position to say, can we go back to building and say there's something in the original idea? The, uh, uh, yes and no, uh, because I mean, we have also been through a, a scientific development uh, right. where, we ha where we have taken these things apart. And one of, the, uh, one of my countrymen actually, uh, who discovered uh, electromagnetism, Hans Christian Oerstel, uh, in uh, what was that, 1820, I think. Uh, I mean, he was he was pretty modern science uh, minded uh, in his way of working, and even he was like, "Oh, I may have found the world spirit in electricity," uh, <laughs> and so he right. was still, you know, struggling with what is spirit and what is electricity and what is power and what is what is energy. 
So, right. um, uh, so yes, and what's interesting about these German Bildung thinkers is that they're also part of, of a Romanticism and Sturm und Drang, uh, which is where they talk about uh, spirit and nature and the spirit and man and, and the sp or spirit and humans uh, and the world spirit. And right. also, what is a spirit in a people? And, and when you read what they write about this spirit, which they call, I mean, the German word for it is Geist. Uh, right. In English, we mostly know it from the word poltergeist, but <laughs> Geist is really means <laughs> right. spirit. Um, yeah. and, and so they struggle with this spirit concept. And of course, before 1700, and, and in the Christian era, spirit was, of course, the Holy Spirit and the right. spirit of God. So, right. so, yes, that was what people, you know, what they had to work with. Mm -hmm. And then comes the enlightenment right. and, and sort of pushes away all the spirit, spirit stuff. And now we right. just need to be rational and scientific and measure everything. And then people felt this existential emptiness. And that is why... Uh, the uh, Bildung philosophers and I mean, and it's the same people, the German idealists, who then talk about yeah, idealism and spirit, Geist in nature and in people, uh, and not just people as individuals or, uh, but also as a people, a group of people. What does it mean to have a spirit as a people? What would be the American spirit? What would be the Danish spirit? And when you read these. Uh, what would that be, 1780s, 1790s, and onwards until the 1820s, uh, romanticists and idealists, and when they talk about spirit, it is really hard to figure out uh, if they're talking about uh, an independent uh, consciousness that is sort of, you know, oozing through everything and, in, <laughs> and in interfering with our minds. Or it just means that by sharing a language and cultural heritage and all you know norms and uh, and aesthetics and traditions, um, we partake in a spiritual heritage that is not physical, but which is also not metaphysical. It's just um, the best way to describe what goes on between or among people. Uh, based on culture and language. And what is also interesting is that simultaneously with this whole uh, wave of Bildung thinking from what would that be the 1770s, 80s, 90s, um, two of, uh, or, or one of the German philosophers, uh, Moses Mendelssohn, writes that there, there are three new words here. One is culture, one is Bildung, and one is enlightenment. And so he mentions oh. the German words for these three things, enlightenment, Bildung, and culture. And all of these three words are, are book written words. They are not common among people, but what do they mean? And so he's struggling with defining the relationship between culture, Bildung, and enlightenment. Okay. And Thank you um, for uh, that uh, discussion. I do want to get time to get, get to the next um, question sure. from David Hurst. Um, David, uh, do you want to ask that? Uh, unmute yourself because I, I also, what you ask is on my mind as well. First of all, thank okay. you very much for that. Uh, sorry for all of that, but that was really very helpful to me. Thank you. I will, I will follow up with you. Please do. Uh, hi there. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, by, by way of background, I should mention I, I'm a corporate uh, manager turned educator uh, who went through a, a compelling experience, corporate experience, 40 years ago and has been trying to understand it ever since. And what I turned to was ecology. And I have an ecological model uh, briefly suggests that uh, enterprises are conceived in passion born in communities of trust and practice, grow through the application of reason, and mature in power where they get stuck. And that takes them, this is a long cycle, uh, let me try and draw it here. It's an infinity loop, it's based mm. on ecology. And um, so you end up with power and then you get stuck there because you get development of elites uh, and you know, all that kind of stuff. 
when I look at your Bildung Rose, I want to drop it into the center of my model because I see it as a snapshot in time. And um, what it's missing is the dimension of time. Right. Uh, of how we start in what the Greeks called kairos, uh, the live time, the here and now, and we end up in chronos in abstractions uh, and, and, and power. And, and, so, and it's so you get the tension between the existential where it all begins and the instrumental where it all ends up. And, and so there's a movement, a systems movement taking place. And of course it ties in with complex adaptive systems and all that kind of stuff, as well as the, as you mentioned, the German distinction between uh, Naturwissenschaft and, and Geisteswissenschaft, which is not made in Anglo-American management where they just assume uh, natural science methods can be applied to the human condition, which uh, is, is frankly not a helpful view. Right, and where so, science uh, is used interchangeably for both uh, sciences and for technology. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So I just wondered, uh, how do you respond to this whole issue of, of time? Because this is the human dimension. That, right. as Kierkegaard said, we, we, we live it forwards, but we only understand it backwards, once again, through abstractions. And that takes you out of a life. Right. So, I mean, this, this rose, uh, I mean, the only thing that kind of represents time in this is the complexity that, that goes out and, and how each domain becomes, you know, uh, more and more complex over time. Um, but it does not have it, it does not have any it doesn't depict in, in that way any any movement as, as you suggest with the uh, infinity sign and and I absolutely love that I mean to, to somehow put movement into the into the figure into the model would, would be really great but I, I have I've only you know tried to look at, at domains and relationships but of course they do evolve over time and if and if we look at power in the center um that evolves as well um and and so i, I would say the the power goes sort of or the the time goes through the model as um a, like if, if you imagine it as a more or less like a like a cone going out expanding over time in in um well, I, I, th I think we should uh, talk some more because in, 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 the, in the infinity loop model, uh, you have uh, Mary Parker Follett, who was a student of 50, and her distinction between power over and power with. And power is collective power and uh, power over, of course, is hierarchical power. And, and of course, tying them together is this whole issue of scale, that when you're working with very small organizations, collective power is very easy. You can run the whole place on collective power. As soon as you start to scale, you end up with modules and technology specialists and hierarchy and all the problems. Uh, and it turns to power with turns into power over and then gets abused. And I mean, that's where we right. are at the moment uh, right. in, in liberal democracy. Right, and and so we need. I mean, that's also why we develop uh, checks and balances and and procedures and documentation. And then you got entire you know departments or professions taking care of that. Uh, the, the the building rows is fractal, so within yeah. say the domain of of uh, technology, there is also production and technology and science and ethics hopefully and narrative about what the what the technology is about and there's aesthetics uh and and power so um so i mean there will be subdomains and there will be sub subdomains and it, it the, the more complex society is the more levels or layers of uh of subdomains there will be and um and in a society like ours, I mean, it's incredibly complex. And now we're connecting globally, and somehow we have we have to to have you know eight billion people collaborating and or at least living in uh, in social peace among each other, and we have to you know save nature from ourselves, um, and uh, and that is going to be incredibly complex. And it's it's a challenge that we are you know 
we're born ignorant. So we have we have to learn all of, of, of the necessary knowledge that we need in order to navigate this between, I mean, we got, I don't know, 25, 30 years to learn that. Um, and, and three generations ago, you could just go to school for seven years and that would be okay. Yeah, true, uh, but of course we are born into a culture and a language, and sure. uh, and we and you know suggestion that that our DNA also equips us to do some things and and, and, and not others. Right. Um, I need to interrupt real quick. We have about fifteen minutes left um, for people who are looking to get a certificate of completion through my company, Humanist Learning Systems. I need your name as you want it on the certificate your email so I can email it to you and which certificates you want. Um, you can have one, two, or three of them. There's the HRCI, the SHRM, and a general certificate of participation in this program. So just put that, uh, you can message me uh, privately or do it in the thing, it doesn't matter, but put it in the chat room and there it will be. Elizabeth, next question. Um, thank you, and I will open it up for Ken. Um, Ken had a question, if you wanna unmute yourself, Ken, and ask that. Yes, uh, here's my uh, question about the, the building. So from, from Asian perspective, so Asian people uh, think about, so, so the body practice in like a Zen Buddhist uh, practice. So, so spiritual mind uh, lives in the just the moment we practice so if i if i try to understand what the uh, building means so could you tell me about the, what relationships between the building in the european continent idea and so asian idea could you uh, tell me so i think that um i mean first of all all the major spiritual traditions have some sort of understanding of this emotional development as well and you find it in buddhism you find it uh, in confucianism and you find it in in uh, i mean in all the the major religious and, and spiritual traditions and they give it different words and they come up with different explanations for it and reasons for it um another way of looking at the uh, at the building rose and i have not developed this very far um, but it was just a, a loose idea, which is that the, um, the, the, the science part of it, the, the scientific part, the sort of, uh, sort of the, the male, the, the yang, and then you got the aesthetics and the narrative, and maybe also the production, I mean, the female, I don't know. But there's something about the male and the female in, in that, uh, that rose also. I mean, there's, there's a difference between the left and the right hand side of, of the model. And, um, and, and if, if you could apply yin and yang to it somehow, maybe you would have that also sense of, of integration. But how it should be adjusted to the model, I don't know. But I absolutely think that uh, what, what is usual, for, uh, usual, what is useful uh, from Eastern philosophy is the concept of, um, of, of uh, opposites creating a whole, a wholeness. Whereas Western philosophy, not least thanks to Aristotle, sees the, the either or and the separation of opposites. And what is important in the, in the building rows is that they create a whole and you cannot pick out one and say it, it's more important than the others. Um, and I, I also think that um, without any other um, you know, resemblances, I would say it's the same thing as with the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There's this Western, I guess, tendency to say, oh, which goal is the most important? But that's not how it works. It, it's the totality, it's, it's the uh, um, interconnectedness that is the point. And I think that Eastern philosophy is, is way better or has a longer tradition of understanding this and, and describing this. Um, so yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, can I can I add something more about my question? So, mm -hmm. so I think the Asian uh, cultural tradition uh, do not want depend on uh, 
a language uh, clarity. So most of the Asian people understand through the just practicing, not depending on the uh, language. They're just doing the same as they are doing. So it's a, uh, what I want to ask you is uh, how can we uh, apply the, the idea that you uh, mentioned in this the conversation uh, in uh, the, without having a clear language? So the way that I, I understand your, your question is that um, this is a very sort of academic and intellectual model and it, it's, um, it's very word based and language based, uh, but you want, I mean, there has to be ways of making this applicable to everyday life. And yes, in, in other words, so, so the explicit knowledge is more so a knowledge um, that you, you have been creating, and, but the, so particularly Japanese um, prospect that we, uh, uh, we have been creating the uh, tacit knowledge. Mm. So everybody understands. Oh, so this is this is the way we are doing it, but uh, nobody uh, can't figure out this is a, a way of doing it in right. language. Right. So yeah, I mean, tacit knowledge and and the transfer of knowledge by uh, apprenticeship. Uh, has has a very long and strong tradition in in Western culture, but we have, for some reason, uh, gotten rid of it. So, I mean, if if you go two or three hundred years back to the time of Schiller and Fichte and all these people, uh, you know, apprenticeship was was the norm. I mean, that was how farmers learned how to you know uh, grow their their fields, and it was how uh, carpenters and other craftsmen. Uh, learn their crafts, um, but I mean, due to technological development, uh, that is not enough. I mean, there there's so many new things happening that what my generation knows from experience, there there are things that I simply cannot. I mean, I can pass them on, but there's so much more that young people have experienced that I haven't experienced because of the technological development and. Uh, and the world that we live in now, and, and if we go back a hundred years, um, I mean, first of all, if we go back a thousand years, people's individual lives did not change from one generation to the next. If we go back 200 years, individual lives may have changed from one generation to the next. Uh, so, I mean, you couldn't just do what your parents did. You had to figure out for yourself what you needed to do. And maybe even that's just, you know, a hundred years ago. But now we're in a situation where all of us can barely use, I mean, it's barely useful what we did 10 years ago. We all have to keep upgrading our knowledge. And so um, how, to, how to educate ourselves and others and how to uh, you know, develop tacit knowledge is, is gonna be a huge challenge under such uh, huge uh, changes in our, in our societies and uh, and if I, I mean, my way of getting to understand Eastern culture, for instance, I mean, I have, <laughs> I think I uh, spent uh, like four hours in an airport somewhere in East Asia on my way to Australia. I think it was Singapore, I forgot. But anyway, I mean, that, that is how much I've been to East Asia, but I've read a lot about it. And I read Confucius, I read about yin and yang, I studied macrobiotics and, and you know, um, got into Japanese culture uh, from that direction. Um, and so that is, that is my introduction to that. I, I simply have not had a chance to, to get to know East Asian culture from actually being there. And with the new flight restrictions and the coronavirus, it's gonna take a while before I get that chance. Well, uh, 
as you write yeah. about this, Lene, um, I'm excited because it sounds like this is an opportunity for future development of the model is just to, to integrate this. Very um, much. I know we're, um, we have five minutes left. Um, I, uh, if anybody needs a certificate, please type in your information in the chat box and we'll send those out to you. Um, I wanted to close with um, a real quick question. Um, have you gotten to apply this model in a company and what were the results? Not yet, but we're, uh, we were about to apply it as uh, an introductory course to students uh, at uh, uh, tertiary edu education because they have a lot of dropouts. And so we figured that if, if we were working with this model, they would be more aware about why did I choose this education and not another education. And now that I did choose this education, can I use it for something that's really meaningful? And not just because that was the, you know, the education that I happened to choose or could pay for or afford or, you know, had the grades to get in. Uh, but we're looking for companies that would like to work with this model and, and to actually work with it and, and see how that, uh, how we can use it. Because whenever I, I show it to people, I get the exact, you know, kind of feedback that I, that I get from you. I mean, people just see all these connections and really, you know, it sparks a lot of questions and interest. Um, but we haven't had a, a chance. I mean, we published the paper about the building rows uh, in November of 19. And uh, it's in my building book that came out in June 20. And we set up the website yesterday because I'm gonna, <laughs> I was going to talk to you guys today. So, uh, so I mean, this is this is this is really new. Uh, I've written about it in Danish for many years, but it, this is uh, the sort of world premiere in English. Yeah, yes. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We're on the cutting edge. Thank you. Now, when I look at this, I'm immediately thinking if I was consulting with someone or having a conversation about strategy in a nonprofit group I'm with that this would immediately be useful as a way to help us all get on the same page about how to bring in everybody's concerns, right? I remember I, I used to work at a tower company and you know the people who were in uh, maintenance had a different valuation of what, what a good tower was, which was a tower that wasn't gonna fall down, than the marketing people did, which was can I sell space on this tower versus the accounting people, which was can we make money on it? And it seems like this rose would be a very good tool to help the team, the various teams with right. their various interests come together and have a conversation that, okay, you know, you're here, I'm here, you're the, I, this other person's there. How do we integrate into a power, collective power that honors all of that and integrates it all? Right. To me, that's right. what I look at this and my practical side is I can use this immediately to help people get on the same page, assuming yep. they're willing, you know, you, it, I think politically that might be hard, but it, within an organization of like-minded people that are already on the same page, but are not on the same page, it seems like it'd be immediately useful. Right. And to, I mean, asking people, so where, where do you, is there one of these domains that you think is more important than, than the others? And if somebody says, yes, technology and forgets everything else, you can say, okay, so that, that might be where we have our problem with the conversation because I see something else. Um, so, so you may clear up some, uh, some misunderstandings and, and hidden assumptions. Right, and it would also allow us to bring in the ethics and the narratives and the aesthetics that we're all missing from normal, normal decision-making, right? Right. So, yeah, very cool. And actually, and, and if, I, if I can just give one piece of advice, because not a lot of people are aware of this, there are philosophers who have studied ethics and they're actually worth talking to. I'm not one of them. Uh, but whenever I do talk to business people about ethics and, you know, what kind of values and mission statements you have in your company, and I ask, and, and they say, yeah, we work with ethics. And I'm like, okay, so who are you talking to? Oh, we're just talking among ourselves. I was like, do you ever invite a philosopher? A philosopher? What are we going to use, use a philosopher for? Like, they study ethics. I mean, they know the different ethical models and philosophies, and, and they can bring in different questions. That was like, oh, I didn't know that. So uh, a little bit of uh, advertising for the philosophers here. I mean, we, <laughs> there are people out there who have actually specialized in ethics, and, and sometimes we do need to invite them in a lot of more often, actually.
All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. I really am so glad we got introduced and that you agreed to do this because this was just one of those mind expanding conversations and I'm so glad you came. Um, so thank you on behalf of everyone.